Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to the third day of the Einstein Forum Conference, Imagine Solidarity. Our first speaker today is a philosopher. He's written on Kant, Spinoza. He's writing on Descartes. More importantly, from my perspective, he's also a publicly engaged intellectual on the left. Um, he's written for Die Zeit, for the New York Times, for publications in Israel. And in particular, I want to point out an article he wrote last year in September on Trump and democracy, which, alas, proved absolutely prescient about the developments, especially regarding Trump's um, abilities as a bullshit artist. I want to welcome Amri Berm to the Einstein Forum. All right, this paper does have actually some, some echoes from the, that uh, site article you, ref you mentioned. Um, maybe a paragraph that echoes that article, so we're going to get to talk about that. The hostilities between Trump's administration and the media have evolved ever since he took office as a conflict about the facts or the truth. Tensions were high already on Inauguration Day, for the incoming president had campaigned with what many interpreted, including myself, as a discourse of bullshit in the strict philosophical sense of the term, that is, showing little interest in truth or falsity. But as it became increasingly clear that Trump was moving from bullshit to a system of what some people interpreted as organized lying, previous tensions with the media erupted into overt epistemological clashes. Kellyanne Conway's claim that the White House could provide alternative facts sets the tone of the debate. It was a symbolic moment, but not necessarily the most disturbing of all. Her justification of a Muslim ban by reference to a non-existent Bowling Green massacre signaled that things were escalating, as did Bannon's denunciation of the media as, quote, opposition party to what Trump had called the movement. Soon thereafter, the president himself tweeted that the media was not his enemy, this is familiar, but, quote, enemy of the American people. America's liberal media retaliated quickly with some very aggressive moves of its own. Newspapers started bringing their fact-checking procedures, which previously mostly remained behind the scenes, into the explicit four. It is by now quite common for news outlets, accused by the administration of spreading fake news, to print titles such as, quote, fact check, President Trump's first week in office. As if to threaten with strategic weapons, the New York Times announced that it has reconsidered its unwritten l word policy. Previously, editors at the Times insisted that lying depends on an internal state of mind and intention which cannot be fact check. And accordingly, they revised lies, or descriptions of lies, with alternative words such as falsehoods, untruths, or errors. But since Trump took office, the verb to lie has been printed. The Times is now also running a new advertisement ad. Quote, truth, it's vital to democracy. No alternatives, just facts get up to 40% up to off the time subscription of your choice. <laughs> a few months ago, I saw a CNN news anchor speaking live to the camera, sending a viewer who had accused the network of spreading fake news to go fact check. This passionate campaign in defense of factual truth no doubt is vital to democracy. It reasserts the media's commitment to sustaining alive whatever remains of America's capacity for rational public deliberation. Without it, democratic politics will wane and die. But we should also notice with suspicion just how comfortable, in fact eager, American news outlets have been declaring here a holy war. Arguably, their crusade, some people say jihad, 
in defense of the facts, also represses a deeper worry, deeper worries really, about truth and its relation to politics. Ones that concern not just Trump, but the forces making him possible in the first place. Forces that have everything to do with the possibility or perhaps impossibility of imagining solidarity within a liberal framework, and that's gonna be my problem today. So here's a quote, and some of you would know it. Take care of freedom, and truth will take care of itself. Take care of freedom, and truth will take care of itself. Richard Rorty liked repeating this slogan to capture the essence of American liberalism. The idea was to radicalize Jeffersonian toleration, or what is the same, to take to the extreme enlightenment state neutrality. Just as the state ought not impose a religion on its citizens, it has no right, the argument goes, to promote a specific conception of the good. In other words, just as politics must be freed from the authority of God, it must be liberated from the authority of truth. Not merely factual truth, and this is in a way just the point, but truth understood as some metaphysical conception that could ground or guide universal norms, and one could think of solidarity. American liberalism thus consists, to use another favorite slogan by Rorty, which will be important for me here, it consists in asserting, quote, the priority of democracy to philosophy, the priority of democracy to philosophy. While America's liberal media is fighting for facts, American liberalism has in fact rejected truth much more comprehensively, and this is something I'd like to think about. Now, paradoxically, the most effective way to undermine truth's impact on politics is not to attack facts, but to fetishize them. Wittgenstein famously claimed that, quote, the world is a totality of facts, and concluded more or less directly from this statement that, quote, there cannot be ethical propositions, end quote. The point, of course, is not merely that ethical claims such as all human beings ought to receive human rights or equal rights are not confirmed by the facts. It is that they can be neither confirmed nor falsified by them. Thus, to the extent that worldly facts are elevated as the model of valid assertions, ethical norms are quickly degraded as, at best, myth, ideologies, or subjective opinions. At worst, they can be dismissed as nonsensical. Now, to appreciate the predicament that is caused by this rejection of truth, it is necessary to understand it in relation to a deeper antagonism between truth and politics in more general. Whereas politics is a realm in which powers and wills are negotiated, truth is indifferent to the influence of both. Not even the most powerful of tyrants and not even the most legitimate of democracies could decide that two plus two equals five. If truth ever does influence politics, therefore, it can only be despotically imposed on the political realm from without. And in political terms, the question then is whether human powers should be guarded not just by, say, constitutions, checks and balances, and international treaties, which do belong to the political realms and bend to the um, uh, powers of the political, um, uh, the political realm, but also by truth, which remains indifferent to those political power monopolies. And of course, tyrants' obsessive aspiration to undermine truth is due to their inability to accept such external impositions on their will. But before we get too comfortable with the obvious current association, we must notice that not just Trump, but liberalism itself, certainly as Rorty understood it, but perhaps not only, relates to truth like tyrants do, by refusing to recognize its authority over the will in this case, the people. Now, if the subjection of truth appears democratic at first rather than tyrannical, then this may be due mainly to two facts. First, that we do not quickly think or we're not ready to believe that democracy can be tyrannical in some way. This will be problematic later on in the talk. And second, because we are accustomed to thinking here of, say, Stalinist ideology or Nazi science as the paradigmatic historical examples in which truth 
were imposed on the public. And of course, the gruesome results of these experiments with truth and politics are familiar, and their lessons ought not be forgotten. But with Trumpism looming in our future, and with global politics and worldwide crisis urgently reintroducing questions of universalism, we should begin to realize that there is another side of this coin, that the people's will too, if it isn't censored by truth external, and precisely in this sense metaphysical and perhaps not democratic authority, can become tyrannical. Tyrannical, moreover, in a way that would undermine our ability to imagine solidarity worthy of the name. Roti has been treated recently as the prophet of, current, of our current democratic predicament. I don't know if people have noticed this. I suppose everybody has. I think, if anything, he is a false prophet here. That's really the reason why I'm giving this paper. A thinker who may have grasped the current predicament better, I think, is Tocqueville, who claimed early on that American democracy and the doctrine of, quote, equality applied to mind, in a way that's just the doctrine of the priority of, democ of democracy's priority to philosophy, we'll talk about that, would lead to the tyranny of the masses. I will speak of Tocqueville later. It was always irresponsible to think it possible to take care of freedom without taking care of truth. By now it should be sufficiently clear that the truth will not take care of itself. Consider this proposition. We hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why do we believe in the existence of this truth? Truths, moreover, that are self-evident. According to the Declaration of Independence, our inalienable human rights were given to us by our creator. And earlier in the text, the founding fathers had appealed to the station given to us by nature's God. But of course, from the perspective of modern political science, from the perspective of modern liberal doctrine, this appeal to God and metaphysics is futile. German basic law, if you want to go there, refrains from turning to God as a grounding principle. It only states in the preamble that Germans are, quote, conscious of their responsibility before God and man. It's not a grounding principle here. But this elimination of God from the equation is done in a characteristically modern way, that is by pretending that simply disregarding the Almighty would be sufficient to achieving humanist ideals. The truth, I think, is that we have never managed to vouch for universal human rights in sensible modern terms. One common strategy has been to appeal to nature rather than to God. On this view, human beings have inalienable natural rights. But in order to accept this alternative, this alternative, one must ascribe to nature qualities that science tells us it doesn't have. Blind evolution, the source of anything we might call human nature, <laughs> certainly cannot be the source of normatively binding inalienable rights, to go back to a, the talk yesterday, rights that entail duties. Nietzsche, I think, is the most consistent naturalist philosopher after Darwin. A more promising alternative, which was developed in response to the inadequacy of grounding rights in, or duties in God or nature, is, of course, Kant's attempt to appeal to reason, that is, to claim that the rights of humanity are grounded not in God or nature, but in our capacity for rational deliberation. However, in order to uphold this position, one would have to defend a metaphysical conception of reason, that is, an account of rationality that transcends its reduction back to naturalist, blind naturalist explanations. And while Kant himself did defend such a conception, a metaphysical conception, current liberal political thinking prides itself for being post-metaphysical. John Rawls' dominant formulation of justice is famously political, not metaphysical. I will return to this. And of course, Habermas just recently reaffirmed his early familiar slogan according to which, quote, we have no alternative to post-metaphysical thinking. Now, 
While it may well be true that we do not have such an alternative to post-metaphysical thinking, it is also true, I think, to speak with Kant that, quote, every theory of justice must contain a metaphysics, and without the theory of justice, there is no theory of the state, end quote. The world, the world is now facing the refugees, I think, with this predicament. We're trying to find room for the refugees somewhere between Habermasian or Rawlsian post-metaphysics and Kant's insistence that only metaphysics could ground universalist claims. And this seems to me to be at least part of the problem of, you know, we can speak about rights very comfortably, but it's very difficult to then make them binding duties. Modern liberal thinkers can meaningfully speak about the state as an instrument for defending the, in the interests of its citizens. When they speak about the state as defending justice or universal inalienable human rights, they are missing the necessary vocabulary. What he would say, and I think that we must appreciate his challenge here, that they are merely attempting to, quote, enjoy the benefits of metaphysics without assuming the appropriate responsibilities, end quote. Consequently, it has been more comfortable in the present context, think of the refugee crisis, to appeal, consciously or not, to some extra commitments generated by the German past. But this evades the more general and urgent question of the refugees' actual political claim. Here lies a subtle but pernicious fallacy, I think. While it is true that German history may and probably does generate special commitments to human rights, the problem is precisely that we do not quite know how to think of these rights in political terms. In Germany, you sometimes need to remind people, that's been my experience, that this crisis is not about the Germans. <laughs> Whatever the duties there might be, the German duties, this crisis is about the refugees and their claim. At no moment was the inadequacy of her language clearer than in Merkel's last year's summer news conference. She said, quote, universal citizen rights have so far been closely connected with Europe and its history. Fell to answer to the refugees, she warned, and quote again, this close connection with universal citizen rights will be destroyed, end quote. If Merkel wanted to address the refugees, she should have probably said human, not citizen rights. What she did say was all she could politically vouch for, but it was not relevant to the refugees, whose standing is, of course, precisely of non-citizens. Subconsciously, Merkel must have been struggling with her reduction of humans to citizens, for she repeatedly insisted in that speech of prefacing citizen rights with the adjective universal. But universal citizen rights is in fact a contradiction in terms. Universality here is a property of the set of all humans, whereas the exclusive set of citizens is ones to which the, the refugees do not belong. Of course, this can be, I mean, one could think of uh, a world state and uh, claim that all, that's not the situation. So. Maybe it's not a logical contradiction. Unfortunately, we cannot blame Angela Merkel. The fact that her contradictory reference to universal citizen rights went virtually unnoticed is a sign that we have all managed to internalize the reduction of humans to citizens. And most of the time, for most of us, this quandary is easily contained. We are all citizens of states. Our rights are protected by those states. So the metaphysical confusion remains an academic problem, academic precisely in the derogatory sense of the term. But clearly, under some circumstances, an academic metaphysical question can make comeback as an urgent political one. In a short article from 1943, we refugees, Hannah Arendt warned that the one fate more dangerous, this is 1943, the one fate more dangerous in the world than being a Jew 
is being a human being. Or more precisely, being just a human being. Quote, if we should start telling the truth that we are nothing but Jews, it would mean that we expose ourselves to the fate of human beings who are nothing but human beings, end quote. It is impossible to imagine a stance more dangerous than this, Arendt writes, quote, because we actually live in a world in which human beings as such have ceased to exist for quite some time, end quote. Her response to the situation is best captured by a term she coined, I think in that article, the right to have rights. And many reflections on the topic have been footnotes to Arendt since then. But Arendt knew well, I think unlike some of her followers, that the right to have rights can only be an articulation of the problem, not the statement of a solution, which Arendt knew would require thinking beyond the, fam the familiar horizon. Among other things, it is likely that this attitude encouraged Arendt's break with the Zionist movement. The point is this, whereas she wanted to address the Jewish refugee crisis, by learning to address the Jewish refugees as human beings with rights. Zionism preferred to fall back on the old political categories to secure the Jews' rights by making them citizens of their own nation state. So this was, uh, um, in that sense for her, not an adequate, could not be the adequate solution of the genuine problem. I have here, uh, I'm gonna skip here a part of the paper where I deal with, say, Rainer Faust, who I think is trying to uh, give an account of the right to have rights, and I think is um, uh, moving between precisely um, a position that's very metaphysical, but pre pretends that it isn't, and for that reason cannot really um, um, vote for the right to have rights. I think that Arendt did not try to do this. Um, she realized that there was a problem. She was not offering a solution. The inability of liberalism, which in this view can only be post-metaphysical, to answer universalist demands is especially complex because once truth is excluded from politics, patriotism quickly replaces it as an anchor of public norms. That is, instead of justifying political agendas by reference to metaphysical grounds that could sustain universalist humanist aspirations, God, nature, reason, language, you name it, liberals vindicate their position by reference to their own practices, speaking with royalty, they justify norms by reference to something, quote, local and ethnocentric. I'm still quoting their own national pride, their own community and culture, end quote. For such liberals, what counts as politically acceptable or gets excluded as obscene can only be vindicated by reference to the, quote again from Rorty, body of shared belief which determines the reference of the word we. I'll read it again, it's going to be important in the following. The body of shared belief which determines the reference of the word we. Significantly, what his words here could have been roles just as well. Notwithstanding the familiar notion of the veil of ignorance, supposedly you do not know who you are behind the veil, in so far as Rawls did not aspire to provide a transcendental deduction of American liberalism, but promoted a conception of justice that is political, not metaphysical, he could only furnish a conception that begins with a we and is relevant to us. Here is a quote from Rawls. Since justice as fairness is intended as a political conception of justice for a democratic society, it tries to draw solely upon basic intuitive ideas that are embedded in the political institutions of a democratic society and the public traditions of their interpretation. Justice as fairness is a political conception in part because it starts from within a certain political tradition. We hope that this political conception of justice may be at least supported by what we may call overlapping consensus. That is, by a consensus that includes all the opposing philosophical and religious doctrines likely to persist and gain adherence in a more or less just constitutional democratic society." End quote. There's hardly a bolder expression than this of the idea that democracy is prior to philosophy because this priority is articulated here 
as Rawls' very method. He continues in the same essay, quote, philosophy as a search for truth about independent metaphysical and moral order cannot provide a basis for a political conception of justice in a democratic society, end quote. Instead of searching for some independent truth, Rawls then recommends that we collect, quote, basic intuitive ideas and principles, basic intuitive ideas and principles that are implicit in our convictions and organize them into a, quote, coherent conception of justice, end quote. Slightly more specifically, the method Rawls prescribes here is that of reflective equilibrium, which in a sense has come to define, I think, the liberal refusal to let truth influence politics. Instead of making universalist metaphysical claims about, say, the rights of humanity, we justify norms to ourselves against our own local assumptions, against the backdrop of what gives meaning to the reference word, we. The crucial point here, I think, is the dependence of reflective equilibrium on the idea of theoretically accommodating our intuitions. The notion of intuitions here is important. Rawls sometimes uh, speaks about considered judgments rather than intuitions, but um, I will not go into that here. And also, um, in the paragraphs I um, quoted, he does speak about intuitions explicitly. Very generally speaking, the idea be behind the method of reflective equilibrium is to begin with our intuitions about cases and principles. What are your intuitions about justice? What do you think about this or that thought experiment? And revise conflicting intuitions and intuitions about principles in order to accommodate the most intuitions you can and the ones that are the most basic. But the point here is this. The intuitions themselves, this is really just the point now, are your intuitions, depending, say, on your common sense or your ordinary language, which is just another way of saying that your intuitions begin with what you believe in because of who you contingently are, given your contingent history. Here's a comment by Timothy Williamson about the reliance of intuitions in philosophy. He speaks also of um, the, their use in both theoretical and um, political philosophy. Quote, Philosophers' uncritical talk of philosophy as relying, for better or worse, on intuitions often manifests the misconception that our evidence in philosophy consists of psychological facts about ourselves rather than facts about the philosophical topic itself." End quote. This statement seems to me to accurately capture what Rawls and Rorty are doing, only that we should notice that they do so in full awareness believing that in our democratic post-metaphysical world, that's the only type of philosophy that can and should be done. It is because democracy is prior to philosophy that justification on this view can only proceed as a justification given our contingent intuitions, given who we are as a result of our history and tradition. Now, it is customary in some circles very prevalent, the ones I circle in certainly, to ridicule Descartes' non-historical, bodiless, abstract res cogitans, the thinking thing, and Kant's abstract um, uh, thinking subject, um, as in fact the standpoints of white, western, colonialist, white men. The same accusation is then often raised against Rawls, and specifically against his veil of ignorance. The only people who can afford putting themselves behind the veil, the argument goes, are white men, now metaphorically conceived, that is, those who have the power to, um, to go abstract, to become neutral in that sense. Now, I'm personally less attracted to the uh, charge against Descartes and Kant, even though I think it does have a bite once in a while. But I do think that the charge obviously hits a nerve when applied, when applied to roles. Given the method of deliberation applied behind the veil, the veil of ignorance, can probably be described not as a veil of ignorance, but as a veil of intuitions. Our deliberation and justification isn't really masked by not knowing who we contingently happen to be. Just the contrary. Given the reliance on our intuitions in the method of reflective equilibrium, the method actually posits who we contingently are, given our tradition, history, language, and so forth as the very beginning of 
philosophical, political reflection. Rawls' reflective equilibrium, then, is just the way in which democracy becomes prior to philosophy. That's the point. Putting it in Rawls' terms, it is a way in which norms are vindicated against the, quote, I, I read it before, the body of shared belief which determines the reference of the word we. But the problem with this procedure is just this. Whenever politics really matters, whenever it really does matter, politics is precisely not about, um, it's precisely not about um, vindicating and revising norms in relation to the reference word we. Whenever politics does matter, it proceeds as a debate and often the war over who would get to utter this word successfully. Right? The civil war is the most obvious example of this. <coughs> and so far as this debate or this war begins with a we rather than ends with it, in so far as this debate cannot fall back on a prior external authority, in this sense not a liberal authority, of universalist conceptions of humanism or justice, this liberal we can only become exclusive and tyrannical. And I'll say a word about why exclusive and why tyrannical those are harsh words, perhaps. In a short essay from 1996 bearing the title, Who Are We?, Rorty suggests that the title's question must replace the essentialist, metaphysical, he says Kantian, question, what are we, as the fundamental question of philosophy. Who are we is philosophy's fundamental question, he says, because it is the one that, quote, has always already been answered whenever all other questions are answered, end quote. Rorty does not explicitly say so in this essay, but given that what are we, of course, is not a, an available question here, who are we can only be answered by the same method in which all other questions are answered. That is, by drawing on our intuitions, or in other words, in relation to the, quote, body of shared belief which determines the reference of the word we. But that's the most accurate, perhaps ultimate expression of the way in which the we for Rorty is assumed at the beginning of the political philosophical debate rather than in the end of the process. It is always already to us that we will answer the question, who are we? Not to any larger, even external group of people that might demand to participate in our conversation. In this sense, strictly speaking, Rorty's claim that the question, who are we, is the fundamental question of philosophy, because it is a question that has always already been answered whenever all other questions are answered, is false. Given that democracy is prior to philosophy, there is an answer that had been given before the allegedly fundamental philosophical question has been answered. The who are we question is not the one that has already been answered whenever all other questions are answered, it is the one that has been answered whenever all questions are raised, including this one, who are we? And as said in the crucial political moments, for those who are not part of this we, this exclusion, exclusion will have crucial implications. Here are a couple of very frank quotes from Rode. I really think he's the most honest philosopher, one of the most honest philosophers um, I read. Um, a couple of frank quotes from Rorty from the same essay, who we are. Quote, suppose that there is no imaginable way to make decent life changes available to the poorer five billion citizens of the member states of the United Nations while still keeping intact the democratic socio-political institutions cherished by the richer one billion. Then they, the latter, the one billion, will begin to treat the poor and unlucky five billion as surplus to their moral requirements, unable to play a part in their moral life. The rich and unlucky people will quickly become unable to think of the poor and unlucky ones as their fellow humans, as part of the same we. And Rorty continues, quote, 
those who make the decision about feasibility, right, so the we, those who make the decision about feasibility are answering the question, who are we, by excluding certain human beings from membership in we, the ones who can hope to survive. When we realize that it is unfeasible to rescue a person or a group, it is as if they had already gone before us into death. Such people are, as we say, dead for us. Life, we say, is for the living." End quote. Bearing this quote in mind, it is illuminating to confront Roth's 1996 title, Who Are We?, with Arendt's 1943 title, We Refugees. The refugees are those who, as refugees, cannot fall back on their own tradition, state, or institutions. They cannot say, we Americans, we Germans, we Israelis, but neither can they meaningfully say, the argument goes, we humans, and expect this to entail duties for others. This would involve a metaphysical fallacy, an attempt or you would say to, quote, enjoy the fruits of metaphysics without assuming the corresponding responsibility. As Arendt put it in her essay, the main problem with being a Jew in 1943 was that, as a Jew, you were only a human being. That was a quote, right? And we live in a world in which human beings have ceased to exist for quite a while. Now, I used the word tyranny with, with um, respect to reflective equilibrium, and that's perhaps not so nice. Um, but I do want to use it because I think that the allusion to Tocqueville is worth the note. In democracy in America, Tocqueville argues that the doctrine according to which, quote, there is more enlightenment and wisdom in many men combined than in one excellent individual who might conceive the truth. The doctrine, quote, of equality applied to minds would culminate in the tyranny of the masses. As a passage from Democracy in America, which would be incorporated in 1943, in 1944, into the dialectic of enlightenment, um, captures this. Here's a quote. Chains and executioners, those are the crude instruments formerly used by tyranny. But today, civilization has perfected even despotism itself. Monarchs had materialized oppression. The democratic republics of the present day have rendered it an entirely affair of the mind. They have rendered it an entirely affair of the mind. Under the absolute sway of one man, the body was attacked in order to subdue the soul. Such is not the course adopted by tyranny in democratic republics. There, the body is left free and the soul is enslaved. The question is this. How does, for Tocqueville, oppression becomes an entirely affair of the mind within a democratic society? And Tocqueville's answer is elevating equality as a norm in the sphere of thinking entails that the majority's standards of judgment would be enforced not by physical threats, but with normative and even moral authority. This, I think, is just the doctrine of equality applied, sorry. But what is the doctrine of equality applied to minds if not the idea that democracy is prior to philosophy? And how does censorship become an affair impacting directly the mind if not through the method of reflective equilibrium? Subjecting all justification to our own contingent intuition, the claim that we cannot do anything else, is just the way in which the majority's standards of judgment, their common sense, receive normative force. We may accept or reject Tocqueville's analysis, this can be debated, but if I'm not mistaken, reflective equilibrium is the deepest expression of what he meant when speaking of the tyranny of the masses. Okay, last stretch. For years, Rorty's patriotic liberalism has informed the rejection of America's so-called identity liberalism. Identity liberals, the argument goes, justify their thinking by reference to abstract truth, most often some politically correct variations on Marxist analysis of power, which Rorty did interpret as metaphysical. 
for they have given up on the patriotic locution, we Americans, as an anchor of politics. As a result, instead of promoting pragmatic political agendas that could answer to the urgent needs of America's middle class, those people retreat, or what you would argue, to the spectator's armchair, to sophisticated philosophy, and not really philosophy, comparative literature departments, deconstructing American society into an infinite celebration of difference. In Achieving Our Country, a once infamous treatise that today gets quoted and requoted as a rediscovered oracle, Borti urged the left to ditch identity liberalism and reclaim patriotic politics. Otherwise, here's a quote that everybody was uh, tweeting and quoting and interpreting. Other quote, otherwise, something will crack. Americans will start looking around for a strongman to vote for, someone willing to assure them that, once he is elected, the smug bureaucrats, tricky lawyers, overpaid bond salesmen, and postmodernist professors will no longer be calling the shots. End quote. It hasn't been sufficiently noticed, I think, but these patriotic liberal oracles served, among other things, for the, as a metaphysical foundation of Mark Lilla's controversial New York Times intervention, the identity, the, the end of identity liberalism. And I think we may want to think of identity liberalism as a form of solidarity liberalism. Hillary was, quote, at her best, Lilla argued, when she spoke, I'm still quoting, to Americans as Americans about our understanding of democracy. When she slipped into the, quote, rhetoric of diversity, calling out explicitly to African-American, Latino, LGBT, and women, women voters, she handed over the country to Trump. Even if such liberalism has successfully promoted gay, African-American, and women's rights, Lila concludes, on the level of, quote, electoral politics, it has failed most spectacularly. National politics is not about difference, but about commonality. Whoever will manage to capture Americans' imagination, quote, about our shared destiny, will dominate national politics. And of course, when Lila refers to, quote, our understanding of democracy, to our shared destiny, he is appealing to Rorty's patriotic we. Recall this was the frame of reference that replaced truth as the anchor of American liberalism. And for this reason, I think it is bound to fail. Even if America's left must move beyond identity liberalism, and I think that it must, still given the priority of democracy to philosophy, the distinction between, given the, the um, priority of democracy to philosophy, the distinction between identity liberalism and patriotic liberalism is itself a lie. Patriotic liberalism is nothing but a species of identity liberalism, not of women, blacks, LGBT, or Muslims, but of those who already confidently assert, we Americans. American politics, like all politics, I'm now just repeating myself, has never proceeded by vindicating and revising political norms in relation to the reference word we. When it mattered the most, it's the most obvious in America, really. It was a debate and, indeed, the war about who will get to utter it successfully. This debate, even this war, about the word, we, still continues. If it will not fall back on the, on the non-liberal authority of truth, on some prior universalist conception of justice that is not reduced to the intuitions of Americans, there would not be a way to distinguish between the slogan, achieving our country, and make America great again. Thanks. Questions? I have my own question. I'm not going to ask it right away. I'm going to ask it when it fits the best, but I may interrupt the sequence to, um, to insert my question as the moderator. But I think I'll start. I think I saw Philip first, or was it? I, okay. So, um, so the Sorry. Thank you very much, Omri. I detect 
Uh, it's a very interesting and richly and richly um, organized and referenced paper. But I detect through it a thread of argument that I think really puts into focus um, a lot of what's been going on in, in, our, in our meetings. And I wonder whether you would accept the following um, reconstruction of what I think is at the heart of your paper. So I want to start with Caustic's very useful distinction between fraternity and solidarity. And I, I'm not sure that your, your paper actually um, makes that distinction at various points. But one might say this, um, thinking about the Arendt paper that you cited, which I, don't, I didn't know before, that we have what Dominic yesterday saw as the problem of achieving global human solidarity. And we might think of that as coming from one of two routes. One route is by extending the forms of fraternity that we have so that they become universal. And the other route, which was so clearly laid out in Elida's presentation yesterday, is the thought that that's the wrong way to begin. That the right way to, to start is actually to abstract from and, and go away from and regard as worrying the forms of fraternity and think in terms of a very abstract pers perspective of reasoning our way into various forms of, of duties and, and, and rights. Now, you can, you, can see how, you can see how this reflects on the various figures that, that you discussed. So, one might think that the, the, the right way to do this is to extend the rather local, community-wide notions of empathy that are there already in our fraternal relations to others. Or one might think, no, that's actually the wrong way to do things because those relations always are include and also exclude. What we should do is we should start off with the, the golden rule or some other, or the categorical imperative or some other uh, abstract reasoning that will lead us rather directly. Now, I want to go to what Dr. Bartolo said yesterday evening in incre this, his incredibly moving presentation. He actually said both. He said, it's a simple human duty to help these people. That, that made it sound as though he appreciated this, the, the sorts of framework within, within which Elida was thinking yesterday. But then he also said, in response to the question, well, why is it that in Lampedusa this happened? He said, well, we are fisher folk. And, and so it was as though it was an extension, an empathetic extension. So all of this comes to the debate between um, whether empathy is serious and helpful um, whether it can be recruited, as Dominic suggested yesterday, by using uh, literature and film, or whether empathy stands in the way <coughs> and what we need actually is to reflect and to think. And then, of course, come all the questions that you were bringing up about the places from which we start in our reflection and thinking. So it seems to me that your paper brings out this, this conflict rather nicely, and I wonder whether you would agree with that. I'm not sure that I can uh, relate to everything that you said. I picked a few, uh, a few points along the way that I can comment on. I'm worried about, um, for example, the, so the, the, the fisherman point, right? Think about the fisherman point. The reason why we help the refugees is that we're fishermen and we know that experience. I come from Israel. Um, the place that was supposed to solve the problem of the Jewish refugee uh, problem, try to make the argument, we know what's it like to be stateless. Um, because of that, we ought to, um, I mean, forget accepting refugees, mm -hmm. but uh, ending the occupation. People's decisions how to interpret um, what their history is committed to depends on 
prior criterions. And I think that without the universalist criterion binding you to have a certain interpretation of what your history commits you, um, each interpretation can, I mean, each history could run a different, a different way. This is really the last uh, word in my paper, right? Uh, achieving our country can also be um, make America great again. Um, some people interpret uh, Jewish history here as uh, saying it will never happen to us again. And some people say we have to um, accept refugees. We have to understand that those are human beings. So um, I do think that there are competing um, alternatives here between the universalist position and the, um, the position of empathy. But without the universalist one, I'm, I fear that empathy would, would not exist. <laughs> or at least it's not necessary. D um, it would not be a matter of duty. So you meant, you meant in your paper eventually to come out on the side of fraternity is the enemy of solidarity. Um, yes. I'm, I, I will say, this was another, you know, I'm... It depends how you interpret fraternity, because often it is understood as a biological issue, as with Zionism is obvious. And uh, it perhaps it doesn't have to be. But, I, um, mean, I think we decided yesterday in the discussion of this paper that it didn't have right. I know, but... Uh, Pat, do you have the microphone? Yeah, or? Uh, here in front. Um, so I, I think I agreed with almost everything you said, and now it seems unfair that I'm going to go to the one thing I thought I disagreed with. Um, I thought I heard you say th that nothing could be the basis of rights which arose naturally, and I don't see why that would be true. Um, think about parental love, that arose naturally, right? Those who took care of their children left more descendants than those who were indifferent or hostile. Um, this doesn't make parental love selfish. You didn't do it f for your genes. It, it, what it means is because this was so conducive to survival, people now have incredibly strong parental love. I don't see why you can't get a perfectly natural account of why people consider other people's points of view, whatever, why people think that my rights aren't safe unless I guarantee that everybody else's rights are safe. So I, I thought in pursuit of the universalist, you were thinking, well, the metaphysics really here is pretty shaky. All I mean by metaphysics is facts. And it strikes me as a fact that parental love is very strong. It's a fact that, that is true because of evolution. That's how it came to be true. And I don't see why you can't have something equally strong in a sense of fairness or whatever that humans are endowed with that is actually a perfectly adequate basis. So I, I'm happy to give up on Descartes' immaterial soul. I'm not very happy to give up on facts, and I'm thinking you're not really either. I just did not understand the last, the last part of your sentence, as in, um, I'm not willing to give up on facts, I, I just don't want to fetishize them. I don't I, want to... I, no, I don't, yeah. but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, your setup of this looked like if you were fetishizing facts, that led you to believe that any normative considerations could not be rooted in natural considerations. I take it's a normative consideration about loving one's children or something like that. So, um, first this reminds me that I thought Philip was going to ask me about the fact-value distinction and really uh, butcher my piece about that, but uh, um, so we'll have this over lunch. But, uh, um, um, but, so I'm going to pick on your example rather than on the general idea. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that I know how to think of love as a right or love as duty. Um, it, is, it may well be possible that um, parental love um, originates with uh, nature, but that might be 
just one expression, I don't think the only one, of the way in which um, love cannot be spoken about as a duty um, or a right. Um, you cannot say, I don't know, I'm now a father, I don't, you cannot say that I have a duty to love my son. Um, that's, it wouldn't be love if that yeah, was no, the Yeah, no, I didn't mean um, to be doing it that way. What I meant to be saying was, out of nature wrought red in tooth and claw, you can get love. <laughs> and so I don't see why you can't get a normative basis for rights. I didn't mean to say love was a normative basis for rights. Right. I meant to say I don't see why you can't get senses of justice, senses of fairness. Senses, yes, but duties in a good old Kantian sense, as in binding duties, it's, yeah. uh, it's reducible to nature. Yeah, I think you could. Anyway, yeah. I won't. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll chat. What? I mean, you had a question, Rainy, right? I, okay. Yeah, it follows very hard on the heels of, of Pat's, which is <laughs> to try and... Th I, I'm interested in your views on a form of intuition which is certainly contingent because we can prove that it's historical, but it is unlike most contingent intuitions, it is not the result of our current experience, contingent in that sense, but rather the result of a vision of a world that does not yet exist. So in the history of many cultures, there have been such intuitions about another possible world, and sometimes those visions have been realized, always imperfectly, but without those extremely strong intuitions, first of all, of such an alternative order, and secondly, of the possibility of such an order we would not be having the discussion we are currently having about global solidarity. So the, this, is a, this, is, this is a historical entity which fits very uneasily both within our discussions about facts but also within our discussions about the contingency of intuitions. And I'd be very interested in your views about it. I think it is a matter of fact that what you say is right. So. Um, we would not be having this discussion about universal uh, humanity without those visions. How do we understand those visions? Are they, are they, I, I think I know the answer. I think it's prophecy, right? Um, it's the prophets who gave us um, um, those visions, right? And that's the moment when we have to ask about the authority of those prophecies, right? Um, when prophets spoke about universal, so I mean, there would be two ways of doing this. One would be to go to philosophy and say ground universalism in say nature, reason, and so forth. But that would be the metaphysics. The other would be the visions you're talking about, the intuitions you're talking about. And those are um, more or less those of the prophets. And the question then is how we relate to them. Do we think that those prophets had some authoritative force over um, our thinking. If we think that given this or that prophetic imagination of a certain society which is not tied, is not justified in nature, it's not justified in history, it's what they think, not falling back in this case on metaphysics. Why do we have again to treat those intuitions as having authority? I'm assuming here in answering your question that those intuitions, those visions, are precisely not emerging out of common sense, right? Because if they do emerge out of common sense, then we, we fall back on the yeah, same previous problem. This is completely external to what we think. Someone from within a certain conceptual scheme thinks a different thought and um, speaks about it, convinces about it, and so forth. That's profit. I take it that's precisely the way in which truth impacts politics from the outside. That has no room, those prophets have no room in uh, liberal democracy um, directing norms. I have a very brief rejoinder, please, which is that um, I'm not sure that the most prophets cry in the wilderness. 
That is, most prophets um, spew their words and they bear no fr fruit. The real question is, there must be something about those prophecies which do take root and flourish, which as you say, cannot be an appeal to common sense, but it must reverberate with some other aspect of more universal experience. And that is the real question. I, it's not about, that's why I feel the word prophet with its overtones of revelation as the source of authority are ill-placed here. I feel that it must be a much more widely distributed phenomenon, perhaps re recurring to Alida's wisdom literature. I, I think um, this is why, you know, in, in a way, I'm stretching it. That's why I wrote a book on Kant and Spinoza, right? Because um, if prophets do not speak with authority of uh, divine revelation, but still speak to um, universal experience, that's supposed to have binding force, the question is, what is it? Is it uh, nature? That would be a um, metaphysical conception. So I'm not sure that this would be an alternative to the um, view that I was laying out. It would either be not binding at all, or it would draw on a metaphysics on, or on revealed religion. It would be, what would be the authority of those prophets, if not the we, they wouldn't be prophets, they would just speak common sense. Or nature, say. I have the extremely um, unfortunate role of saying that we have a lot of questions and little time. Um, so I'd like to collect brief questions, three at a time. Please, begin. No, you're right. I'm sorry, he, I just don't know I, your I, name. I'm sorry, yes. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for this very rich paper. I have just three very short <laughs> questions. One is a comment about uh, maternal love. I mean, I come from France, and uh, uh, one of the best sellers in French philosophy was Elisabeth Badinter, a liberal philosopher book, L'Amour en Plus, which really showed with so many data that maternal love is not a matter of uh, uh, evolution or nature. There is nothing natural in maternal love. It's the most social constructive, uh, constructive. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really a social construction. There is a book that comes from United States, maybe a reference which is more familiar, which is Sarah Hardry um, book uh, on uh, mothers and, uh, and others, which shows also that maternal love, in terms of mothers, are not so um, like the protagonist of this love. Uh, uh, and I really, um, 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 uh, it's an important point. Secondly, uh, with, on your exchange also with uh, Lorraine Daston, I was, isn't it, your, 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 um, you, you started with a classical point, truth and democracy are a sort of intention and what is the place of truth uh, in a democracy, but aren't we, um, uh, isn't it, isn't there a concept which, uh, uh, is less uh, uh, opposite, which is that one, uh, the, the concept of objectivity. So we have the idea that uh, we need objective, not subjective dependent, objective procedures to uh, have political decisions, like procedures that are objective, that can be controlled, and we, have, we need a, um, the, a similar uh, concept in science, objective procedures. Actually, I would say that the birth of uh, the Western culture in uh, Athens, etc., etc., is about the birth of objectivity, not of the concept of truth. The fact that we need the procedures that are public in order to say that something true or false. So, and I skip on the third because I'm too long. Okay. Uh, Stephen Holmes. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. this is in a way uh, uh, just an elaboration on the last point. Uh, the, your paper was uh, you know, beautifully delivered, but I didn't see the relation between the way you began, Trump, conspiracy theory, lying, my the biggest crowd in the world, the biggest victory in the world, Obama's not American, these are lies. Yeah. And then you leap in order to, into metaphysical, moral, truths, is there something about human beings that makes us obliged to do something for refugees? So the relation between that, truths of those kinds, and the way truth is normally talked about in politics, such as there's a problem in politics which is false certainty. People believe things that are wrong. 
you have procedures like a court procedure. We think he's guilty. It turns out when he can see the evidence and help his attorney pick apart state's evidence, it's false. Uh, or in, you know, in the Mil Miltonian, uh, Mil you know, John Stuart Mill, the, the evidence we have for our belief in politics is that there's an open invitation to the whole world to refute it. So you force executive officials to be interrogated in front of Congress, who then ask them what are the, what's the factual basis by uh, which you're using to justify your decision to invade Iraq or something of this kind. Those are true. So there's truth in this sense. That's what the Trump argument is about. And uh, very much uh, uh, hard to break because his lies are parts of conspiracy theory, which are creating identities that are, which are invulnerable. They seem to be. The problem with them is that there's no amount of evidence that you can use to the people who believe or enter into these conspiracy theories to refute them. So in that sense, you're right. That is the end of democracy. So I'm just, what's the, the uh, relation between the way you began and then your beautiful uh, Rawlsian, Rorktarian uh, elaboration? Uh, and do you want to go now, Elijah? Just, does it relate directly? Yeah, uh, okay. you said you wanted to collect three. So yeah, no, I know, but Misha was next yeah. on my list. But well, I, it, um, <laughs> I would like to bring the um, discussion of intuitions into a more psychological and more concrete perspective because I think it's really important uh, what this body of shared belief is like and how it works politically. Um, so if we take the um, Holocaust, for instance, um, um, the Germans have taken away a very different body of shared beliefs from the... Um, Israelis, um, whereas the Germans have uh, taken away what is called in therapy, for instance, Glaubenssatz or implicit ex uh, axiom, uh, we are not, we do everything not to become perpetrators again. So we don't rush into action, we don't, we are very hesitant, we are non-national, we, we are we're doing everything not to be become perpetrators again. In Israel, the um, implicit action, we are doing everything not to be become victim again. And this seems to be uh, the reason why the implicit axiom is not, we know what it is like to be stateless. This is exactly not the shared political um, belief. And now therapy has the great uh, function. I come back to uh, Jennifer's talk here. How can we change these implicit actions which, which acquire the force of Glaubenssatz implicitly because they, they, are, they are so strong because they are intuitions. So uh, one has to um, reflect on them, one has to inspect them from time to time, and one has to change them, of course, also to some extent. So I think um, it would be perhaps worth to take this on onto a, from the political into a more practical uh, context. Okay. You are now. I see. <laughs> I'll be very brief in part because I don't have a worked out answer to all of those questions. <laughs> um, objectivity versus truth. I'm not sure how to go about answering the question because I'm not sure how you mean objectivity. So. A sort of procedure, a public procedure to check itself. That you have in science and that you have in right. so, the, um, um, so here you might end up with, with, a, with a, a, a sort of a fact value distinction question because I'm not sure about how it fun it's going to function in science, um, but um, to the extent that this public procedure is supposed then to be about uh, norms, political norms, political agendas and so forth, conceptions of justice, um, what would be an objective conception of justice that, as a public procedure, would not draw on um, the prior intuitions that I call, you know, the, the veil of intuitions we were talking about? The question is about whether, the question is whether there is an available such procedure, public procedure, that um, would not fall back, so that would not in this replacement of truth by objectivity would not again just begin with our intuitions and who we are. At least in philosophy, you know, the Williamson um, uh, paragraph that I was reading is actually going there against um, um, a lot of theoretical philosophy, not so much practical philosophy, right? So in philosophy, the method of intuitions. Um, uh, everybody thinks with intuitions, what's your intuition? What's your model intuition? What's your... So, um, to the extent that norms would be now objective norms and would then draw on those intuitions, I think we would end up with 
um, similar problems to the ones that I was uh, suggesting. That might be precisely the point. Now, Stephen re really asked me a question about um, the structure of my paper. Um, um, but it, it became a deep question about the paper itself um, with a question, you know, because also back to Pat's question, are you really against facts, right? Because I was um, speaking somewhat, you know, with irony about this whole crusade or jihad um, uh, that the media is now invoking to, in defense of the facts. I'm, I'm for defending the facts. I think that um, it's very important to defend the facts. I actually had a, a coy sentence saying that in the piece. Um, in brackets, I think that the text to go uh, um, to, go to uh, in thinking of what you said and how significant the facts are for um, politics and democracy. It's not just Arendt's truth and politics, but her, um, the crisis of the republic would be the, um, the place to go. Right? Um, I only began with this uh, introduction about uh, the media and their crusade about the facts to make one point. There is a whole public debate about defending the facts. I want to say that's a place where we're comfortable. Of course we have to defend the facts. It's possible that um, part of the urgent discussion that needs to be done is not in this debate about the facts. Not just that. It is the debate about liberalism and its relation to a universalist conception of justice. And that you could at least, one way at least in which you could read this whole facts crusade, which again is important, is that it is also, I, I emphasize also, a way of, you know, it's just our comfort zone, you know, it's just, um, it, it almost serves to repress the urgent, less convenient for liberals um, discussion that needs to be had. I mean, think about this is really, I mean, I, I used that example, there are many others, for a reason. Truth, it's vital to democracy, no alternative, just facts, get up to 40% off the time subscription of your choice. <laughs> I'm not sure that the New York Times would be selling newspapers. <laughs> Uh, uh, by having that debate. This? Refugees have no contagious diseases. We heard this last night. That's a fact. Excellent. That's like it has Excellent. A strong political Absolutely. consequence. Absolutely. And people use the lie that they do in order to repress the humanitarian gesture. So you, you think that's Absolutely. trivial? No, and I think it's, it's not trivial. It's crucial. And those facts ought to be defended. I'm saying there is something here that's in addition to this is extremely important and is taken for granted, should not be taken for granted. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. There, was another, there was a last a light last is question. Yeah. Yes. Um, just quickly. Um, how did you call that in German? It was shamefully a word that I did not know. Glaubenssätze. Well, just oh. axioms then. So the, there are not... The, but they're not really axioms in some logical sense of the term, right? Um, so, so I think what I said in response to Philip would apply. How do you choose your different um, um, axioms, right? Um, I'm well aware of the different axioms that are um, operative in, say, Israeli consciousness. They're not really axioms. They need to be changed. But, but they are the axioms, and they really are axioms. This is, in a way, a good way of putting my point. They really become axioms if you begin with the dear we, um, we Israelis. They really would become axioms in that sense. And you would not be able to justify norms contradicting them, which is precisely the point. OK, I have three final questions um, now that Misha has given up his. Um, Rudiger? Amber and Alexander, please, as short as possible. Hate to say it, but there is no other way right now. Dennis, so starting with Rudiger. Thanks, I would like to try to defend uh, Richard, <coughs> the standpoint of Richard Rorty a, a bit. And my, I think, I think. I could see this coming too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, 
achieving our country is only that close to America first if you read it out of context. It's an isolated book. But actually it was a follow-up to his famous contingency irony and solidarity. And, and what's important there is, given the fact that uh, Rorty is a skeptic of truth, of absolute truth, the we is the only point of view you, he can start from. But that's why he has his irony, because he says, well, given, given that, we always have to be aware of there is other points of view possible as well, and that we need this, this ir <coughs> sorry, irony as balance of it. And what's even more, solidarity. And solidarity means for Rorty, solidarity not with, only with human beings in general, but with all feeling beings in general. So, and America first is way, uh, uh, way from uh, uh, this kind of rotty irony and this kind of rotty <laughs> solidarity. And just a small coda f on that before you go into Amber. I mean, he does talk about, the, at the end of um, contingency, uh, irony and solidarity, about the importance of pain as somehow outside <coughs> of these, these contingent elements. That's sort of like his truth in a way. Um, Amber. Um, good. So this is a, a, a comment turning into a question that's picking up on what I think where Stephen was coming from. Um, so you gloss this, uh, uh, first comes freedom and truth will take care of itself. You gloss that as politics, sometimes democracy, sometimes politics, is prior to philosophy. Um, and then a lot of talk about sort of facts. And there's something that struck me as very odd about that. Is philosophers are not who I think of as custodians of facts. Sorry? Philosophers are not who I think of as custodians of facts, right? Um, and, and, but, but importantly relevant to the whole discussion is which humanists do we think of as custodians of facts? Those are historians. So if you were to gloss the Rorton slogan as first comes politics, freedom, democracy, whatever you like, um, it, it, that's prior to history, then we all know we're in big trouble. When you start putting politics before history, right, we, we know the kind of trouble that we're in um, when we assert that kind of priority, okay? So, and that's a, a sort of lead-in to this idea that if a philosopher, well, so, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a philosopher to say, to notice that there simply is no freedom where there are significant disparities of power. And I'm not using that with a big P or any kind of uh, loaded way. It's just, as you say, a fact. There's no freedom where there's significant disparities of power. There's no freedom to speak or to think. And if you therefore postpone truth in favor of freedom, right, and you do, that is, you don't have anything to set against exercise of power in who gets to exercise their freedom. Can then, you repeat that? Can you repeat <clears> that for me? If you have nothing to set to counter against, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my voice is, you have nothing to set against um, power to, to counterbalance. So it's in the exercise of freedom, something like truth, um, then you not only don't get truth, you don't get freedom either. Right. This is really the problem with the without freedom. Uh, sorry, first freedom and truth will take care of itself. And, and, and it doesn't take a philosopher to say that this is a, an historian's point, in fact. Um, recently, Timothy Schneider, of course, pointing that out. Alexander, last question. Um, I was unhappy about your answer on the question of future vision and intuition. Um, I think if you answer with, that's the profit that comes with the problem, you give up on a certain possibility that was given by Rorty himself when he was talking about the strong poets. Yes. That would have been his answer, I think. <laughs> that come up with new vocabularies yeah, that in the end uh, uh, turn out to be a different uh, way of living together. Uh, and he said something very important, and I think it's very important to imagine solidarity. He made a distinction between the beautiful and the sublime, and said the beautiful is a way to arrange things, uh, to arrange things in a way that we understand. 
the sublime is an arrangement of an order that we do not yet understand. So the sublime alone holds the promise to go to a place, for example, a more just world, without yet understanding how this will work. And it's very important to me because I come from the contemporary art world and I've been arguing, using Rorty since 25 years, that Rorty holds something very important to explain why art is politically so terribly important. So I wanted to make that point here. You didn't like my uh, answer, but I liked your question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it. Yeah. So, um, so I read Rorty out of context, that achieving our country, and I think more, um, I mean, that was your claim, I think, otherwise, but the, um, not just achieving our country, which was less in, important in my, in my paper, but um, who are we? That's, that's a real question, right? How do we understand the relation between this who are we and um, uh, his position on, on solidarity and his position on, on irony and solidarity? Um, so I'll just I'll say this very abstractly. Actually, my whole attempt was to do precisely the opposite of what you were ascribing to me. That is, to be reading, to be reading those somewhat more political interventions, achieving our country, who are we, and so forth, um, really against the background of Rorty's position. Rorty's and his account of roles, which I think is honest. Um, Look, of course Rorty ends with uh, this notion of solidarity, which might be a solidarity towards um, a larger group than just, say, the current uh, American group or something of the sort. But the point is, I think, and um, you will correct me in a moment because you know Rorty so much better than I do, the point is precisely that given the method, that the only method that can be available to our understanding of our solidarity, in the crucial moment, those, those are those um, um, significant paragraphs, when, um, when someone will have to be making the decisions about what's feasible and what's not, feasible um, with preserving our convictions, which are everything that's important, solidarity can break. So we will not have the solidarity with the human race if this would imply that we have to really change um, our deepest convictions. Now, you mentioned irony there. I think irony is, of course, extremely important. That is, the, the ironist for Rorty um, is the one who does not pretend that um, the we and the norms that the we vindicate um, are universal claims, right? Uh, he's, he's taking this from Nietzsche, I think, really. The, um, it is not a position from which you somehow, you pretend that your values are universal values or something of the sort. You're, I, you have irony in relation to them. I think that's right, but that's precisely the way in which if you're speaking a certain language of rights, when things become serious, as Arendt would have said, uh, when the chips are down, um, it's not clear that this irony would be enough in order um, to um, really have duties. Um, what does it mean for um, um, small Italian uh, communities to, to really have this enterprise um, uh, of really genuinely happy helping the refugees? By some standards, it will, uh, um, it will mean, as one talk yesterday uh, implied, the death of their community. Right? Um, it can change their whole community. They do not do anything else. Uh, they accept so many refugees and so forth. Or it can be interpreted as the life um, um, of that community. I'm not sure that this irony is enough in order to bind you to actually have a duty. Where there is no duty, there is no right. For that reason, I'm skeptical about whether it's going to actually be very helpful. Um, Amber. 
I'm not sure that I completely uh, understood the question. I was trying to write notes quickly, but now I cannot read them. The, um, <laughs> I also don't think that philosophers are the, you know, the, the people of facts. Um, it is the historians. Those are the historians. And, um, but philosophers are the ones who um, debate norms. And my whole question was about whether we can take norms to have some binding force that's not reducible to um, that's not reducible to politics and to political manipulation. So I'm not sure. I, I completely agree that his, that historians are the ones who provide facts, and this is one conception of truth. And I completely agree that under um, some <coughs> political situations the manipulation of history uh, can be um, horrifying politically. It goes back to also uh, Stephen's question. I completely agree about that. Uh, there are, of course, exa examples, uh, the beautiful examples of um, um, Stalin uh, and Totsky. But the, um, uh, frankly, I mean, I think about this in terms of uh, Israel and the Nakba. You know? um, Israelis do not know that there was a majority of Palestinians uh, living in the territory in 48, and Israeli historians do not write histories of um, what, how they disappeared. It's completely erased part of history. Um, that's pretty, so I'm completely um, aware of the role of history and historical facts and their role in politics. That's significant, and I was not going against this in my paper. I'm only speaking about the further question, not of um, factual truth, which is absolutely important, but of um, the binding claims of universalist conceptions of justice, whether we can make sense of them or not. So I'm not sure that I'm answering your question. I will stop here answering you, because I think maybe we need to talk about this later. I really liked your, um, uh, your question because it is my position that um, Kant's concept of genius in the critic of judgment is actually redeeming um, some type of uh, talk of prophecy as uh, significant for the, for the public sphere. Um, genius is the one, I actually gave a version of this here a couple of years ago. Um, genius is um, the capacity to do or say something radically new. That is something that does not draw on the prior authority of the community from which you come. Now you have to ask questions about the possibility of this, um, of this production. If um, strong poets and geniuses in the end are just reduced back, you know, you can just interpret them back to the um, we from which you come. By the way, in Spinoza's theological political treatise really begins by doing just that. He says, look at the prophets. Everything they say is basically just um, talented articulations of what their culture believed in. Then they are not prophets at all. And they are strong prophets in a lesser sense of the term, that is that they just give you effective articulations of what their we already believes in. I take it Kant's position wanted to um, actually, Kant wanted to go further than that. He wanted to say that you can somehow actually say something that does not depend on um, the prior conceptual scheme from which you walk. This is, com this is complex, of course, because um, it does have to follow some rules and so forth. But in the end, the capacity to uh, do something radically new cannot be interpreted as just depending on um, yeah, the community from which, from which you come. And to that extent, um, the question would be, is it then metaphysical in some sense of the term? Does it fall back on some other authority, uh, aesthetic ideas for Kant or something like that? And we'll have to, this is a place where metaphysics really does emerge, I think, for Kant. Um, or is it what Kant liked to call um, originale unsinn, original nonsense, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is, in a way, just how some people would say art is being produced today, right? So I think that Roti, um, 
I am aware of the places where he speaks about the uh, strong profits, and precisely for that reason, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, because it connects this paper with some other work that I've done. Um, I think that Roti will also be stuck between those two conceptions, and it would be very interesting to, um, to see how to connect them. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank Omri Boom very much.